After a nuclear event, radiation levels in the air might drop after just a few days. But does that mean it's safe to grow food in soil that was exposed to fallout? The reality is more complicated, and getting it wrong could be dangerous. Welcome back to Prepper's Paradigm, where we provide practical, no-nonsense prepping advice to help you navigate the uncertainties of our world. In today's video, we're following up on a question we received after our recent nuclear war survival video. If fallout radiation levels drop quickly, why can the soil still be dangerous for growing food? We'll explore the risks, explain how radiation affects soil, and give you actionable steps to help you make informed decisions if this situation ever arises. Before we dive in, just a quick note. I use a computer-generated voice because an injury has made my own voice difficult to understand. Thank you for your support and understanding. To understand the risks of growing food and soil after a nuclear event, we first need to break down what fallout is and how it behaves over time. Fallout refers to the radioactive particles that are released into the atmosphere after a nuclear explosion. These particles eventually settle back down to the ground, contaminating everything they land on, including the soil. In the immediate aftermath of a nuclear explosion, radiation levels in the air are extremely high. But, as we mentioned in our previous video, radiation levels drop significantly after the first 48 hours. This is due to the rapid decay of short-lived isotopes like iodine-131 which release intense radiation immediately, but lose most of their energy quickly. However, even though the immediate danger decreases, the fallout also contains longer-lived isotopes like cesium-137 and strontium-90. These isotopes emit radiation at lower levels compared to the short-lived isotopes, which is why it becomes safer to be outside after a few days. However, these longer-lived isotopes can persist in the soil for decades, with half-lives of about 30 years. This means that while the danger to us of being outdoors decreases over a relatively short period of time, the soil remains contaminated for a much longer time, and that's where the risk comes in for growing food. Now that we understand how fallout works, let's talk about why growing food in contaminated soil can be so dangerous. The key issue comes down to the radioactive isotopes left behind in the soil, primarily cesium-137 and strontium-90. These isotopes are particularly hazardous because they behave like essential nutrients. Cesium-137 acts like potassium, which is vital for plant growth, while strontium-90 mimics calcium. This means plants absorb them from the soil as if they were normal nutrients. Once these radioactive particles are taken up by plants, they become part of the food chain. When you eat crops grown in contaminated soil, the radioactive particles are absorbed into your body, where they continue to emit radiation. This kind of internal exposure can lead to serious long-term health issues, including cancer. The problem is that these isotopes don't just pass through your system. They can accumulate in your bones, muscles, and other tissues over time, increasing your radiation dose as you consume more contaminated food. Even though the radiation from cesium-137 and strontium-90 is relatively low compared to the intense burst from short-lived isotopes right after the explosion, the long-term exposure from eating contaminated food poses a significant health risk. This is why it's so important to be cautious when considering growing food in fallout-affected soil. Given the dangers of radioactive isotopes like cesium-137 and strontium-90 lingering in the soil, you might be wondering if it's ever possible to grow food safely in fallout-exposed areas. The good news is that there are strategies to reduce the risk, though caution is essential. One approach is to remove the top layer of soil, where fallout particles tend to concentrate. By carefully scraping away the upper two to four inches of soil, you can eliminate a significant portion of contamination. Handle the soil safely, wear protective gear, and store it in a secure location away from your growing area. Another option is to use raised beds filled with uncontaminated soil. This keeps plant roots from reaching the contaminated ground beneath. If you don't have access to new soil, consider using soil from beneath buildings or other areas shielded from fallout. Raised beds allow you to create a safer growing environment, especially for shallow-rooted crops like leafy greens. Additionally, choosing crops with shorter growing periods and shallow root systems can help limit contamination. Root vegetables and leafy greens can absorb more contaminants than fruiting plants, so focusing on crops that absorb less radioactive material can make a difference. 
If you're considering growing food in soil that may have been exposed to fallout, testing the soil for radioactivity is an essential first step. A Geiger counter, while obviously not as accurate as laboratory tests of the soil, can offer a quick and practical way to assess radiation levels in the field. A Geiger counter measures general radiation levels, helping you gauge whether contamination is present and how concentrated it may be near the surface. Test samples of soil from near the surface and several inches deeper to find how deep the radioactive material is within the soil. For this purpose, we recommend the Better Geiger S2 Geiger counter, which provides clear, accurate readings and is easy to use, even for beginners. This model is portable and sensitive enough for practical field testing, making it a valuable tool for preppers assessing soil or other potentially contaminated materials. I'm not associated with Better Geiger. I just like the product. You can find a link to purchase the Better Geiger S2 in the video description if you're looking to add this essential device to your preparedness kit. While growing food in contaminated soil poses risks, foraging wild plants and hunting animals in fallout-affected areas presents unique challenges of its own. Even if the ambient radiation levels seem low after the initial fallout period, plants and animals in the area may still carry dangerous levels of radioactive particles. Wild plants can absorb radioactive isotopes from the soil, especially cesium-137 and strontium-90. Mushrooms, in particular, are known to accumulate high levels of radiation due to their mycelium network in the soil, which absorbs nutrients and contaminants from a wide area. This makes them especially risky to consume if grown in fallout zones. For other wild plants, the risk varies, but those with shallow roots are more likely to contain radioactive material than plants with deep roots. If foraging becomes necessary, focus on plants that are farther from the fallout area or that have had less direct soil contact. Hunting animals introduces similar risks. Animals absorb radioactive materials through contaminated food and water sources leading to a process called bioaccumulation. Over time, radioactive particles build up in their bodies, particularly in larger animals that may have consumed contaminated plants or smaller animals. This means that consuming meat from animals in fallout-affected zones can lead to significant internal radiation exposure. Larger animals higher up the food chain, like deer or wild boar, are at an increased risk of bioaccumulation and can contain high levels of radioactive isotopes in their organs and tissues. Fishing might be a slightly safer option, but it also carries risks. Bodies of water exposed to fallout can become contaminated as radioactive particles settle or wash in from surrounding land. However, water can dilute radioactive particles to some extent, which can make fish safer than land animals. If you do fish, avoid bottom feeders, which are more likely to have ingested radioactive particles from lake or river sediment. Always consider testing any forage or hunted food with a Geiger counter, if available, to help assess the level of contamination. If you need to gather food, water, or other resources outdoors after a nuclear event, taking steps to reduce your radiation exposure is essential. Even when ambient radiation levels appear low, radioactive particles can still pose serious risks, especially when they settle on surfaces, plants, or water sources. Here are practical strategies for minimizing exposure while collecting resources. First, Wear protective clothing whenever you venture outside in fallout-affected areas. Long sleeves, pants, gloves, and a face mask or cloth over your mouth and nose are essential to help prevent radioactive particles from contacting your skin or entering your respiratory system. Even better would be a hazmat suit, such as those linked in the video description. If you have goggles or other eye protection, wear them as well to keep particles out of your eyes. When you return, remove and carefully store or dispose of your outer clothing to avoid bringing contaminants into your shelter. Rinsing exposed skin, if possible, can also help reduce contamination. When foraging or hunting, avoid anything you collect coming into direct contact with the ground whenever possible to avoid any radioactive dust transferring to the food you collect. If you're hunting, remove the internal organs as they tend to concentrate radioactive isotopes. In fish, avoid bottom feeders as they're more likely to be exposed to sediment containing radioactive particles. Limiting time spent in contaminated areas is critical. Radiation exposure is cumulative, meaning the longer you stay outside, the greater your dose. Move efficiently and plan your outings to avoid unnecessary time in high-risk zones. Before venturing out, identify the safest routes and prioritize gathering resources from areas upwind or farther from the fallout zone.
Finally, use a Geiger counter, if available, to check for contamination on collected resources. The Better Geiger S2 model, recommended in the previous section, can provide an initial reading on whether items have concerning levels of radiation. While a Geiger counter won't give you precise measurements of specific isotopes, it can help determine whether certain foods or resources carry dangerous levels of contamination. Understanding the risks of radiation in a post-nuclear environment is essential for long-term survival, especially when it comes to food and water safety. Even after initial radiation levels in the air decrease, fallout particles like cesium-137 and strontium-90 can linger in the soil, making it dangerous to grow food without taking precautions. By carefully removing contaminated topsoil, using raised beds with clean soil, and choosing crops less likely to absorb radiation, you can reduce some of the risks involved in growing food in fallout-affected areas. When foraging or hunting, remember that radioactive particles can build up in plants, animals, and water sources. Avoid high-risk foods like mushrooms and be careful with large animals that may accumulate more contamination over time. Check for radiation levels with a Geiger counter when possible. Protective clothing, time limits, and choosing cleaner areas for resource gathering can also help you minimize exposure. In a nuclear fallout situation, being prepared, informed, and cautious makes a crucial difference. Keep these guidelines in mind and take each step with care to protect yourself and your loved ones. If you found this information helpful, please like, share, and subscribe to support the channel and stay informed about practical prepping strategies. Don't forget to check out our recommended Geiger counter in the description for monitoring radiation safely. Thanks for watching Prepper's Paradigm. See you in the next video.